So let's go to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. And this is a note-taking church, as you know, so I pray you have something to take some notes with today. Because uh, the Lord has a lot to download in Jesus' name. I'm going to start at verse 15. But I'm really going to be walking through the entire chapter. So I encourage you to keep your Bibles open. And be writing down verses as I kind of bring them up throughout the message. But let's look, start at verse 15. It reads, Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. Mm. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. I was going to read a few more verses in chapter 34, but I'll just park right there for now. Um, this is the word of the Lord. Father, help me to teach this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Usually when we think of the book of Exodus, naturally we think of liberation, right? Uh, we, liberation out of the hands of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Movies like, you know, Prince of Egypt. Anybody seen that movie? Okay, movies like that, you know, we see this, how God goes to extreme lengths, to bring his people out. The Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they had been enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. And you probably don't remember this from Genesis, but in Genesis chapter 46, verse 3, God told Jacob, go down to Egypt because it's, it's there in that place. It's there in Egypt that I will make you into a great nation. And the Bible tells us that early on in Exodus that although they were in bondage, Although they were in chains, although they were enslaved, although they were severely oppressed by the new Pharaoh of that time, the chains did not stop them from producing. Somebody shout, I can produce in any season. So God brings them out of slavery, and God never just brings you out to bring you out. He brings you out to take you through so that he can bring you into a prepared place. He brings them out of slavery. He takes them through the desert and eventually into the land that was promised. But that can't be the theme of the entire book of Exodus because there are 40 total chapters in the book. Yet when the Israelites are crossing the Red Sea, escaping Egypt, that happens in chapter 14. So we can't say that the liberation of Israel is the entire theme of the book. Because when they were brought out in chapter 14, what about the other 26 chapters of the book? The truth be told, when we take a closer look at the underlying, the larger meta narrative of the book of Exodus, it's not primarily about liberation, although it is a byproduct. It's not primarily about deliverance, although that is a byproduct. But the overarching theme is the manifest presence of God. Somebody say amen. Meaning all throughout this book, peppered throughout the pages, God has intentionally made himself known. Starting in chapter 3, where God reveals himself by means of a burning bush. Burning bushes was common in the desert. But this bush caught Moses' attention because the bush was on fire, but it refused to be consumed. And the Bible says that the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame to recruit him to be the remedy to Israel's prayers. Starting in chapter 7, God also makes himself known through the ten plagues. And you have to go back and study this, but in your own time. But these ten plagues, they were not just random. 
Yahweh was releasing a strategic polemic attack against the Egyptian gods. Yahweh wanted those who have dedicated their whole lives to gods who could not hear, gods who could not speak. The power of Yahweh in these plagues invalidated their idols. And God didn't stop revealing himself there. When they got out of Egypt and were in the wilderness, not knowing which way to go, not knowing which way to turn, God revealed himself. He made himself known as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night as he went ahead of them and guided their steps. But God didn't stop there. When they were hungry and they had no food, he gave them manna and quail. Right? When they were thirsty and had no access to water, God gave them water from a rock. He revealed himself on Mount Sinai. And when you look at chapter 40, the culmination of the entire book, God's presence comes and dwells in the tabernacle that he instructs Moses to build, which would be God's local address in the earth, marking the physical place where his presence would abide in the earth. The book of Exodus is much broader than social justice. It's much broader than liberation. This book of Exodus, more than we tend to focus on, is about the presence of God. And this is critical because the Israelites are 400 years removed from Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Rachel. Yahweh was foreign to this new generation. So God is making himself known to a people who only have ancestral knowledge of him. Moses was raised, remember, as an Egyptian. He does not know who Yahweh is. And that's why God had to get his attention through the fiery bush. And that's why God had to teach him, I don't know how y'all did it in Egypt with them idols, but when you are in the presence of the Almighty God, you've got to take your shoes off of your feet because wherever I show up, wherever I reveal myself, those grounds become holy. And when God comes to Moses, he says, I am the God of your father." the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And God is introducing himself as such because, again, Moses doesn't know him like that. And to further substantiate my point, God tells Moses, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. And Moses is like, well, if I go, who do I say? I don't even know who you are. Who do I say sent me? Because he understands I can't go in my own name. I murdered somebody there before I left. The authority and favor that I used to have amongst the Egyptians is gone. And so God says to Moses, I am who I am. Tell them I am who I am has sent you. And he says, tell them that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sent you. In other words, God wanted it to be very crystal clear. I'm not bringing Israel out because they know me. I'm bringing y'all out because your daddy knew me. In Genesis 15, God already told Abraham about the 400 years of harsh mistreatment and enslavement of his descendants. But God also told him that there will come a day where I will punish the nation, they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. So at the same time God is calling Moses and giving him restrictions regarding what's next, God is also giving him a history lesson about the promise to Moses' forefathers. And God will spend the rest of the book of Exodus revealing himself, making himself known to a people who had no reference point for who he was. And the powerful reality is that although you are saved and sanctified now, there are some things that happen to you. There are some doors that were opened, some protection that you experience in your life because of a deal your parents had with God. And because of the covenant they had with God, the parents' relationship with God is now blessing the children. Listen to me, parents. I know we all are always thinking about ways to, to leave our children something when, we get, when we're out of here. We're always thinking about inheritance. We're always thinking about helping our children to not have to start off as hard as we have to start off. And all that is fine. But the best thing you can do for your children is your relationship with Jesus on full display. Somebody say amen. I'm talking about every single day in every season, your relationship with Jesus on full display. The best thing you can do for your children is to pray for them continually. Pray for them out loud. 
There are some things that God will do in your children's lives through prayers that will pay dividends long after you're gone. And that's what's so powerful about God is that he can answer the prayers of the righteous long after they have transitioned. Here it is in our text. God sees about the, he comes and sees about his children. He comes and he sees about the Israelites because of the relationship he had with Abraham. But now God wants to make himself known. He wants to reintroduce himself to a new generation. Because how many of you know your mom and daddy's relationship with Jesus, it may lay a foundation. But at some point, Jesus has to become personal to you. And God shows up on the scene, and he makes himself known throughout the book of Exodus. He makes himself known in Egypt. He makes himself known in the wilderness and to the promised land because he's not just satisfied being the God of Abraham. He wants to be their God. But the unfortunate reality about the children of Israel throughout the book of Exodus is that no matter what sign God gave them, He could not do enough to convince them to embrace him as their one true God. Isn't it something how we will constantly put God to the test? We would tell him, Lord, if you heal me, I promise you, I'll spend more time with you in prayer. God, if you help me figure out how to cover this bill this time, I promise you I'm going to start sowing into your kingdom. God, if you help my kids out with this, I promise you I'm going to get in my word like I'm supposed to. And we keep putting God to the test and neglecting to stick to our commitments when he continues to do his part of the bargain, even though he didn't have to. Somebody say amen. And there are many Christians who are basing their obedience to God off of signs. Y'all should have been on Life Groups Friday. We talked about this a little bit. There are many Christians who chase signs. They chase confirmations. They chase affirmations. But the Bible doesn't say that we should chase signs. The Bible says that these signs shall follow them who believe. Somebody shout, we don't chase signs. Signs are supposed to follow us as we're obeying God. Here it is in our text. We have a people who have the privilege of experiencing God's manifested presence. Sign after sign, miracle after miracle. Yet that was not enough for them to turn to God and to follow him exclusively. So God let them die. Yes, he did. In the wilderness never to see the promised land, all because they refused to believe him. They refused to trust him. Because what good is a sign for those whose heart refused to turn in repentance to him? Like many of you, they were blessed by God's provision, but never convinced of his presence. And that was the case for everyone except Moses in this case. Moses was convinced. Moses was decided. Moses had come to the conclusion in our text that he wanted more of God. If you look at chapter 33, verse 13, Moses says, If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, God, that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Moses wanted more of God. And there is a stark difference that the author wants us to see between Moses' zeal for God and the Israelites' apathy towards God. Meaning, they were not interested in dealing with God. They quickly lost enthusiasm for following him and for obeying him. And you have to go back and read it later, but it's even more prevalent in chapter 32. In chapter 32, Moses, he's on the mount seeking God. And the Bible says in chapter 32, verse 1, when the people saw that Moses was long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. And this is the danger when your relationship with God is solely contingent upon a person. Somebody say amen. You shouldn't date someone who only goes to church to convince you to be with them. I'm glad I got an amen. But don't go to church because they actually love Jesus. So they gave Aaron their gold because Moses was missing. They gave Aaron their earrings, and they, they, they commissioned Aaron to make them a golden calf. And this, is called, this, this, this god called the Apis bull was one of the most sacred and revered deities in Egypt during this time. 
And they believe that this Apis bull was a mediator between humanity and divinity. They believe that the Apis bull functioned as an oracle to communicate the will of other gods to humans. And so when the Israelites could no longer see God, instead of trusting his last instruction, they reverted back to that which was familiar, which was worshiping the gods of Egypt. And you want to know what's interesting about this narrative? After Aaron built this golden calf, the Bible says in chapter 33, verse 5, that after he built the calf, he then built an altar in front of the calf. And he announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So he's got the golden calf, just in case you missed it here. And the people are so wicked that they look at this golden calf. And they say to this golden calf, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. They are ascribing God's glory to something they just made with the works of their own hands. And this seems to be max level wicked, but it's no different than you and I ascribing God's glory to your resume. It's not different than you ascribing God's glory to your education. Those things are important, but please remember, if it was not for God, your resume would be real bare. If it was not for God, you wouldn't have the means or the privilege for that education. So Aaron, he builds an altar. Imagine the confusion here. He builds an altar. He, he, he builds this calf, and he announces a festival to Yahweh. So they're building calves, and they're ascribing God's glory to idols, and now they're having a festival, a party to celebrate God on the same altar they built for the bull. And this is a perfect example of syncretism, where we mix a bunch of religions and a bunch of beliefs together, a little bit of witchcraft here, a little bit of superstition there, and we just label it as Christian because we might mention God somewhere in that spirituality. But everybody who says God ain't talking about Jesus. Mm. Matthew 7, 21 says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. And any time you add anything to the truth, it creates falsehood. The Israelites were being tormented by God's distance. So much so that they thought disobeying the first commandment and worshiping something else would help them get in contact with God. And just like today, there is such a longing for the divine that people will turn to wicked mediums in attempt to get to God all because they don't like the exclusivity of coming by way of Jesus. Mm. But yes, even in 2024, where culture teaches us that everybody got their own truth and you should live out your own truth. But if your truth don't line up with the one who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, it ain't truth at all. And it don't matter what you call it. What you have is what the Bible calls a strong delusion. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, he says, They perish because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. And so for this reason, because of their constant rebellion, for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie, and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have found delight in wickedness. Moses, he's on this mountain where God is giving him instructions on how to build the Ark of the Covenant. And in the middle of their conversation, God tells Moses, go down because your people have become corrupt. And oh, how quick they have turned from that which I commanded them. So God says, these are stiff-necked people. Could preach a whole message on that, but I'm not today. Meaning, these are a stubborn, a rebellious people. And the Bible says in chapter 32, 10, that God tells Moses, leave me alone. Because I'm I'm about to go down and destroy them. But what stands out to me so much here in this text, this story, this narrative, is that Moses and God had such a strong relationship. Mm. That Moses talked God out of killing the people. 
In other words, Moses stood in the gap on behalf of somebody else. Moses interceded on behalf of the people who didn't even respect him enough to lead them. And Moses, my friends, he is a foreshadow of Jesus Christ. Moses is what we consider a typology where we get glimpses of Christ's role and function, what it would look like even in the Old Testament. Moses intercedes on behalf of Israel, but he was not the perfect intercessor. Sure, he petitioned God on behalf of Israel, but his prayers for them did not cover their sins. It just delayed their punishment. The perfect intercessor is Jesus. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. This is what 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says, for there is one God. Somebody shout one God. Mm. And there is one mediator between God and men who is the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Now, when we talk about Christ being the mediator, We are not talking about a second-tiered God. We are not talking about a person who is less than. We are not talking about a separate deity. Because Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.19 that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. What am I saying? It's not one God bringing us into reconciliation with another God. It's God in the flesh, incarnated as Christ Jesus, who brings us back to himself. My friends, you and I have favor with God because of Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Moses, he's in prayer handling other business, but he ends up interceding on behalf of the whole nation. And God, the Bible says, relented. And the Israelites didn't even know that their lives were in danger. And here's the beauty of intercession. God blessed some of y'all this week because there were some people calling your name before God in rooms you were not. And you didn't even know it. God blessed some of y'all this week because you have a friend that was calling your name before God. You have a brother and sister in Christ. You had a pastor that was calling your name before God. So don't fall for this trap that nobody likes you and everybody's out to get you. God's got some people looking out for you who's praying for you and they may not even tell you. Somebody is speaking on your behalf in rooms you are not. Thank you, Lord. We can't talk about Exodus without talking about intercession. Yes, you should have an active active prayer life, but every once in a while, you should spend time praying for somebody else. Every once in a while, you should call out to God on behalf of your family. At some point, you must mature to a place where the sum total of your prayer life isn't about you getting another blessing. But it's about you standing in the gap on behalf of the unsaved. It's about you standing in the gap on behalf of that family member whose heart has become hard to the gospel. Moses could have said, go ahead and take them out, God, because they're getting on my nerves too. But instead, Moses stood in the gap. Because you don't love, I want you to hear this, write this down, you don't love what you neglect to pray for. You don't love who you neglect to pray for. You see, these days we think intercession is about how fancy you pray on a microphone. Mm. But volume don't mean you have power with God. I wish I had more amens than that. Big vocabulary don't mean you have power with God. Speaking in Greek and Hebrew don't mean you have power with God. Moses had power with God because of the amount of time he spent in his presence. And I used to be impressed, I'll be honest. I used to be impressed by those who prayed with this eloquence of speech. I used to be impressed by musical skill set and vocal ability. But I'm not impressed with none of that no more. None of that moves me. I know some people who can't sing a lick but can usher a whole house into the presence of God. I used to be be impressed by this superficial stuff, but these days the only thing that moves me is the presence of God. 
appreciate the fact that you can hit the note and that you can play the key, but, but, but none of that matters if you can't usher me into the throne room of God. If you haven't been in his presence all week long, you might be singing the right stuff, you might be playing the right stuff, you might be saying the right thing, but it has no power attached to it. And it's not destroying the yokes off of anybody, and it ain't lifting a heavy burden. If you want power with God, it's going to come by you dedicating your time in the presence of God. Thank you, Jesus. Moses had power with God because he was familiar with his presence. Mm. And after Moses interceded on their behalf, after he pleaded with God not to wipe them out for their rebellion, he said, hold on. That's not the only request I have. Now that we got them squared away, I've got a personal request for you, God. I've got a personal request that has nothing to do with them. Somebody shout, I got a specific request. Moses said, I have this specific request. It's found in chapter 33, verse 18. He says, show me mm, your glory. He didn't say, show us your glory. Hallelujah. He didn't say, show them your glory. He says, no, no, no. While I got you here, show me your glory. And you can always tell someone who's been in the presence of the Lord because their prayer requests eventually change. His request was a reflection of the type of relationship he had with God, and it was a reflection of his desire to know God even more. He said, show me your glory. Hallelujah. Show me your kabod. That, that speaks of his distinction, his splendor, his honor. It speaks of the heaviness of his glory. Moses said, I appreciate the fact that you've been revealing yourself in the burning bush that was catching on fire and all that. He said, I appreciate you revealing your, your power through the ten plagues and, and the pillar of cloud by fire and fire. Because of all those instances, you were making yourself known in earthly ways. But I want to see the complexity of your divinity on earth, how heaven sees you 24-7. I want to see you in the same manner that the angels who cry, holy, 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 sees you. He said, God, I want to see your glory. <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. Somebody shout, I want to see your glory. Thank you, Lord. Now, here's the part of the text that you probably didn't notice. It's in the next verse. When we look at God's response to Moses. Moses said, God, show me your glory. And God said in verse 19, okay, I'm going to let my goodness pass by you. Moses asked for glory. God said, cool, I'm going to show you my goodness. Meaning to God, his glory is his goodness. Hallelujah, Jesus. In other words, if God has been good to you, you have seen his glory. If God has ever made a way for you, you have seen his glory. If God has ever given you peace in the middle of a storm, you, my friend, have seen his glory. The goodness of God cannot be limited to his actions because his actions are simply the fruit of who he is. The word good is just God stretched out. When you experience the goodness of God, you are experiencing who God is at the core of his being. Meaning God is good and his goodness is not tainted and it's not tarnished because you're going through a rough season. Even when his blessings aren't visibly present or tangible in your life, he is inherently good in his essence. In other words, just because it might be cloudy doesn't mean the sun stops shining. And I want to remind somebody today that even on the days you can't see God, he's still good. And you've got to learn to start saying he is good when the bills are paid and he's good when the funds are tight. He's good when I'm in the relationship, and he'll still be good if the relationship ends in flames. He's good when I get promoted, and he's still good if I get laid off. He's good when I get the car, and he'll still be good if the car breaks down. He's good when I get accepted into the program, and he's good even if I don't. Somebody shout, God is still good. And because his goodness is not just what he does, it's who he is, I will bless the Lord. I wish I had a praise in church at all times. And his praises will continually be in my mouth. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 
David said, I would have fainted mm. unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. David said, for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. David said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And if that ain't good enough for you, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Hallelujah. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I don't mean to brag, but God has been good to me. Can anybody testify? God has been good to me. Hallelujah. And because God is good, my only response is I will bless you, Lord, at all times. Somebody clap your hands right there and give us some praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right. He's good. Tell somebody he really is good. And I know that's cliche for some of y'all, but there's a few of us who can really testify like can really we got tangible evidence we got real receipts we got the history we got the the doctor's reports that God really is good thank you Jesus give somebody high five and say he really is good he really is he really is thank you Jesus he really is good He really is good. <laughs> he really is good. Hallelujah. If you have experienced the goodness of God, you have experienced the glory of God. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Y'all be seated. Thank you, Lord. All I'm trying to tell you is that God is good. Thank you, Jesus. I'm glad I got a few witnesses over here that God really is good. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, let's not play with it. Give him 30 seconds of glory right there. Come on, clap your hands. Hallelujah. Come on and give him some praise. If you know that God for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. I promise you, we're going to get right back there. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God is good. That statement is real to me. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. 
been goodness and mercy that's been following me. Through the valley, he's been following me. On the mountaintop, he's been following me. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. God is good. <laughs> he really is good. Just lift your hands and worship him because the Lord wants to do something in you right now. He wants to meet you right there in the middle of your worship. Come on and worship him. Come on. Come on. We push aside our agendas. We push aside the program and we say, God, have your way. Hallelujah. God, meet us how you want to meet us, Jesus. Touch us how you want to touch us, God. Because we know when you touch us, Jesus, we'll never be the same. Hallelujah. And we're not leaving this place the same way that we came. Because God, your goodness is here. Your glory is here, God. So move in this place, Jesus. And we're not talking about the building. But Father, move in each vessel here today, God. Move from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet, Jesus. And burn up everything that's not like you. Everything that's not like you, Jesus. We come against by the Spirit of God in Jesus' name. Come on, be free. Be delivered. Be free. Be delivered in Jesus' name. Come on and give them some praise. Come on and give them some glory. That's what we came for today. We came for his glory. So throw your weight around this place, Jesus. glory. Pull on his glory. I've got to teach you how to worship your way through. I've got to teach you how to praise your way through. Come on. The devil, he can't ever take your praise. He can't ever take your worship. Hallelujah. Circumstances may 
may be crazy around me, but God meets me in my worship. God meets me in my praise. God meets me when I bend my knee. God meets me when I lay on the floor. Hallelujah. Come on, call his name. There you go, Sonia. Call his name. Come on and call his name. Hallelujah. We need you, Jesus. We want your glory, God. We want your glory, Jesus. We want your glory, God. Hallelujah, Lord. We want your glory, Jesus. We want to touch your presence, God, because we know when we come in contact with your glory, we won't be the same. So, Father, in this moment, Jesus, Father, with bending knees, Lord God, with hands lifted, Jesus, we're calling on you, God. We want your glory, Jesus. We want your fire, Jesus. We won't ever be the same, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. We don't want to do church as usual. We don't want to do commitment as usual, God. But Father, set us ablaze. Set us ablaze, God. We want to burn for you, Jesus. We want to burn for you, God. In Jesus' name, Lord. In Jesus' name. We're calling on you, Jesus. We're calling on you, Jesus. Because if you don't come, we won't move, God. We won't move, Jesus. We won't step out of sync with you, God. We won't go before your glory, Jesus. No, no, no. Father, we need you, Lord. We need you for direction. We need you for clarity. We need you, Lord God, for comfort. We need you for peace, God. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, saints, and call on him. This is what the Lord wanted today. Come on and call on him. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, glory to your name, God. Throw your weight around this place, Jesus. Throw your weight around this place, Jesus. Throw your weight around this place, Lord God. We don't want to be stuck in our own ways, Lord. We don't want to be stuck in cycles of sin. But Father, in the name of Jesus, break the yoke. Destroy the yoke in Jesus' name. You have called us to be free and free indeed, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. So we walk into the newness of life today, Jesus. We accept the newness of life, Jesus. Oh, God, come and see about us, Jesus. 